Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Donald Cameron. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest in crofting and farming therein to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to control the number of geese in the Highlands and Islands? Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government spends uh, over £1.2 million annually on goose management schemes designed to minimise economic losses experienced by farmers and crofters as a result of the presence of geese uh, to meet our nature conservation obligations for protected geese species and to maximise the value for money uh, of public expenditure. Uh, on Isla, there's a strategy to reduce crop damage by decreasing the number of Greenland barnacle geese, um, improve habitat for rare Greenland white-fronted geese and help farmers to manage their land more efficiently uh, and effectively. And in the Western Isles and Orkney, Scottish Natural Heritage is evaluating a new adaptive management approach to deal with increasing numbers of resident grey-lag geese. Donald Cameron. <coughs> Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Um, she will know that geese damage to grazing continues to be a major issue across the region, particularly in the U.S. and on Isla. And the Crofting Committee of the Kauai and Ian Shear have said that they are hugely concerned by the apparent retreat in Scottish Government support for the existing scheme. Given the deep levels of concern from crofters and farmers about their livelihoods, will the Cabinet Secretary today confirm if the Scottish Government have any plans to review the level of funding offered within the schemes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, goose policy, uh, a review of goose policy is undertaken every five years by this government. So, uh, in effect, there is a rolling program uh, of review. Um, and in 2015, the Scottish Government commissioned the latest, the current review of goose policy, and that included an uh, issue around the support offered to farmers to manage geese in Scotland through goose management schemes. Um, that review um, is currently being considered by an external quality assurance panel. Uh, and it's due to be completed by November 2017, and I'm sure the member will be interested in those results. I should add, presiding officer, that SNH spends a considerable portion of its budget on goose management, and it cannot just continue to rise exponentially because that isn't sustainable. What we're looking to do is to try and enable farmers uh, to be uh, in themselves through their, their particular management uh, the solution. Thank you. Question number two, Marie Goujon. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with Scottish Water. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. I'm in regular contact with Scottish Water and I receive regular updates on the delivery of the capital programme, which I'm pleased to report is currently ahead of schedule. Further, I had the pleasure of visiting Thurso Wastewater Treatment Works and Gorthlake Water Treatment Works uh, in August. Marie Goujon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I have several constituents experiencing problems with Scottish Water and business stream at the moment, including one who can't take his case to the Ombudsman because Scottish Water have failed to respond to him, meaning the case can't be taken forward. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that customer service should be a priority for Scottish Water and business stream and that it's not good enough that people can't resolve issues they're facing due to their failure to respond? And would the Cabinet Secretary also agree to write to Scottish Water on behalf of my constituents to try and resolve these issues? Um, well, customer service uh, should be a high priority for uh, all agencies, um, and that would include Scottish Water, but they have very, very good levels of customer uh, satisfaction. Uh, if the member would care to give me details of the case that she's concerned with uh, and the issues raised therein, uh, then I will be happy uh, to investigate and take that matter forward for her. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the long-term flooding issues in Prestwick and the pressing need for this to be addressed. And I note from the written answer I recently received that the allocation of funding is by priority. Can she please assure me that the flooding and the flooding from sewers in Prestwick be addressed as an absolute priority and that a flood mitigation scheme will be drawn up as soon as possible, please? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think John Scott has been here long enough to have been involved in the uh, um, flooding Scotland bill which we took through uh, this uh, parliament uh, some years ago. We now have um, a very carefully thought out priority programme uh, which is agreed with COSLA um, and uh, uh, that informs the uh, immediate priorities and is a rolling programme that will be constantly under review. Um, flood protection uh, is an issue for local authorities to address. 
and I'm very happy if the member wishes to raise directly with me any specific concerns he has about a very specific uh, uh, programme, uh, then I would be very happy to speak to him about that. Um, uh, flooding is uh, going to be a constant and consistent problem uh, as we move uh, forward and uh, I believe that in Scotland we have the best possible framework within which to manage the problem. Question number three, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on reorganising local government to ensure that remote and rural areas have decision-making and strategic planning located at the heart of their communities. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government is committed to community empowerment and supporting strong local democracy. In the programme for government, we set out our plans to work with a wide range of organisations to deliver a comprehensive review of local governance ahead of a local democracy bill later this parliament. We will ensure that listening to the voices of remote, rural and island communities is central to that review. Gail Ross. Thank the Minister for that answer. Having had a lot of local discussion with stakeholders in my constituency, I am concerned that there appears to be a large disparity between the effectiveness and inclusiveness of community planning partnerships from area to area. Will the Scottish Government consider issuing specific guidance to make partnerships aware of their responsibilities to be open, inclusive and welcoming to all members of their community? Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, we've recently introduced important changes to strengthen community planning. Uh, since last December, community planning partnerships have been subject to new statutory duties introduced by the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 uh, and, of course, the uh, supporting guidance. Uh, these, give community uh, these give community planning a statutory purpose focused on local public services, working together and with communities to improve outcomes and to tackle inequalities. Uh, on what they agree are local priorities. The Act and Guidance place communities at the heart of community planning. For instance, they require CPP partner bodies to take all reasonable steps to enable any community body that can contribute to community planning to participate as far as that body wants to. I know that Gail Ross is very passionate about this issue and about empowering communities, and I'm more than willing to meet with her to discuss these issues further. <coughs> Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister highlights the importance of local government in planning decisions. Can he then explain the utter hypocrisy in his answer as to overturning planning decisions taken at local level, such as unwanted wind farm developments and greenbelt developments, such as Park of Kia? Minister. Uh, the question that Gail Ross posed, presiding officer, was about community planning and uh, Mr Stewart has moved on to spatial planning. Uh, as Mr Stewart is well aware, the, uh, there is a special place in the ministerial code um, for planning ministers. I would refer him to that and he knows that I cannot talk uh, about any specific case and I would refer him uh, to the letters uh, that go out which give my decisions so that he has the reasoning for those decisions. Yeah. Question number four, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officers. To ask the Scottish Government what they are doing to support the fish processing industry in Scotland. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, we are taking a number of steps to support the fish processing industry. We continue to provide vital funding through our European Fisheries Funds to support processors to invest in the facility since 2007, provided over £30 million of support uh, to support 146 businesses across Scotland. We've also published proposals, uh, as the member will be aware, for a Scottish landings target to increase landings of fish by Scottish vessels into Scotland, uh, thus giving processors more, more raw material to market. And we're providing £250,000 per annum to Seafood Scotland to enable them to promote the sector in Scotland and at international trade shows. In addition, we're working with the industry to develop a new sector-specific action plan to exploit further growth opportunities. Peter Chapman. I thank the Minister for that answer. But the, the reality is that given that we expect increased tonnages of fish landings post-Brexit, it is very concerning that from, that from 2008 to 2016 there has been a 34% decline in fish processing factories and a 12% decline in people employed processing fish in Scotland. Now, these fish are being driven to areas like Grimsby with significantly lower business rates and running costs. 
and there seems to be no government support to drive down costs for this industry and they are facing, as processors in Scotland uh, are struggling with the high levels of business rates, water charges and effluent charges. Will the Scottish Government commit to helping build this industry and stop driving our fish out of Scotland? Minister. It's a remarkable question from, from Peter Chapman for a number of reasons, but let me try to be constructive and helpful where I can in that uh, the Grampian Seafood Alliance recently met with my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Uh, he, of course, wrote to Tory-led Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire Council, reminding them through the community empowerment legislation they have the powers to introduce specific uh, rates, uh, reliefs uh, for those industries. So I'm sure Peter Chapman will join with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. But it is quite incredible that Peter Chapman mentions the decline in employment in those industries. When I look at Grampian statistics, that 70% of those employed by the fishing, fish processing industry in Grampian are EU nationals. Will he not join with this government to call on the UK government to not push for that hard Brexit, to say that EU citizens make a contribution, whether it's in fish processing, hospitality, or many sectors across Scotland? And further to that, will the member not also join with the Scottish government in saying to the UK government that any European money for the European uh, Marine Fisheries Fund that comes back to the UK must come back to Scotland and be spent on our fishermen here in Scotland. And I can guarantee, Mr Chapman, if he does that, uh, he will not be receiving, I'm sure, his P45. <laughs> Question number five, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve road safety on the North Coast 500 route in light of the reported increase in accidents. Minister Hamza Youssef. I thank the member for the question. The Scottish Government welcomes, of course, the success of the North Coast 500, recognises the importance of the North Coast 500 route to the Scottish economy. Uh, in terms of road safety, Scottish ministers are directly responsible for trunk road sections uh, of the uh, NC 500, which comprise approximately 22% uh, of the route through sections of the A835, A99 and A9. Uh, the safety performance of the trunk road elements of the NC 500 is reviewed annually. Uh, the figures for 2016 are lower than the average uh, for the three years before the route was promoted uh, in 2015. The partnership approach, uh, a partnership approach has been taken to improving safety across the whole NC500 uh, and the transport subgroup, which has been set up by the NC500 working group, includes officials from Highland Council, Police Scotland, Transport Scotland, Bear, uh, Bear Scotland, NC500 and Visit Wester Ross. Uh, options that are being considered includes, include passing places, on single track roads, road edge, edge strengthening, improved tourist route signing, as well as general road safety and driver behaviour education. These discussions are, are at an early stage and I, could of I would of course uh, welcome contributions and input from members across the chamber. Edward Mountain. I thank the Minister for that answer. The North Coast 500 has obviously been a tremendous boost to the Highlands. Many people who live near it believe that it's a combination of inexperienced driving on single track roads and frustration that causes accident. Will the government, because the Highland Council are finding it difficult financially, help take the lead in increasing signage on the route to mitigate these two particular problems? Minister. I mean, I will look at any proposal, of course, uh, along with colleagues uh, from Highland Council uh, as part of, and I would suggest that the working group that we've set up in the transport subgroup is the appropriate place to do that. Some of the interventions that we've made recently uh, do focus on uh, signage do focus on uh, uh, single track roads and passing places. So if there is a proposal that comes from Highland Council, we will look at that. I would say, of course, that Highland Council, uh, you know, we'd expect local roads to be funded uh, from that block grant uh, that amounts to, to over 400 uh, million for Highland Council. But nonetheless, uh, any suggestions and proposals that do come forward, uh, I will keep an open mind. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Would the Minister join with me in congratulating the North of Scotland Driver Awareness Team, who have produced a road safety leaflet about driving on single track roads on the NC500 and beyond? And does the Minister share my view that the NC500 route is a stellar success for tourism, but perhaps more work needs to be done in promoting the specialist and technical skills needed to drive on single track roads? Minister. Yes, I agree with uh, all of what uh, Dave Stewart said. Thank you also to Dave. Uh, Stuart, for the member for giving me a copy of that leaflet. I think it's an excellent leaflet, uh, which uh, many uh, of those uh, who drive the NC500 would do well uh, to look at. So where we can support initiatives like that, uh, of course, uh, we absolutely should. 
And, uh, of course, uh, as I say, what more uh, the government can do and Transport Scotland can do as part of the NC500 uh, 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 group, uh, the sub, uh, subgroup on transport, then, of course, uh, we will look to do. Question six not been lodged. Question seven, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Babcock International's proposals to relocate the Defence Support Group site from Stirling. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. I'm very disappointed that Babcock International is considering closing the Stirling workshop, although I understand that a final decision has not yet been made. I very much hope, along with the member who's made many representations on this, that the excellent work of the highly skilled workforce is recognised as a result of the consultation and that we, in any event, stand by in the Scottish Government to provide what support we can. Bruce Crawford. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that the Defence Support Group operation in Stirling is the central point for the maintenance of military equipment and the last of its kind in Scotland? Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Unite the Union, who represent many of the 56 highly skilled workers at both sides, that the proposals from Babcock represent a potential logistics nightmare for the armed forces in Scotland? Does he further agree? There are plans to move significant parts of the service, mainly to Yorkshire and Boveting proceed. This will also be damaging to the local sterling economy. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I certainly do not doubt the importance of the DSG site and the skills of the people employed here. And the MOD's brutal basing cuts announced last year have left a number of outstanding questions on the operational and economic impact of their proposals. The member may, in, may be interested to know that there have been many representations from Conservative MPs down south about closures in this area, not one representation from Conservative MSPs or MPs in relation to the basing cuts in Scotland, which is absolutely astonishing. Uh, but these proposals further underline the importance of MOD ministers coming to Scotland to engage strategically on the impact resulting from decisions to close defence sites, including Stirling by 2022. They continue to refuse to do so, with one exception. Lord Duncan did accept my invitation, although we still have not managed to progress towards an actual meeting. I hope that meeting will take place. But in conclusion, I would say to the member, I do agree it's very disappointing that Babcock are considering closing the facility at Stirling, and I share the concerns that he has, not just about that, but about the footprint of the armed forces in Scotland. Mark Roskill. Thank you. Um, given that Stirling Council's local development plan zones the defence support group site for much needed housing and regeneration. Why is the Scottish Government once again undermining the local development plan and undermining regeneration in Stirling with its stance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think we just heard from the elected constituency MSP from Stirling the views about employment currently in the area. Now, we do treat very seriously employment. That's why we have one of the lowest ever employment, um, unemployment levels in Scotland and one of the highest, in fact, the highest ever employment levels. So jobs are extremely important. Of course, we, and of course, in this case, the MOD, can look at what proposals might be able to accommodate further housing. Stirling needs further housing. But we don't want to be doing that at the expense of good, well-paid jobs for highly skilled people in the Stirling area. And I would have thought that the member would have been concerned about that as well. In Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Stirling indeed has a highly skilled workforce and superb uh, transport links that can well support this dedicated facility. Will the Cabinet Secretary meet with me and Bruce Crawford to discuss options on how we can address Babcock International's proposals? Cabinet Secretary. Hey. Of course, I'm always uh, willing to meet with uh, members and I've had discussions with my uh, uh, colleague Bruce Crawford. Anybody that's willing to help uh, the campaign to make sure we can keep these jobs uh, here, I think, would be important. And perhaps if uh, Dean Locker is willing to, we can extend that conversation to future planned closures by the MOD in Stirling and the rest of Scotland, because that would allow us to address a much wider problem. But yes, of course, I'm more than happy to meet both with Dean Lockhart uh, and with uh, Bruce Crawford, should Bruce Crawford be willing to do so on that subject. It's very important, and we can save jobs in Stirling if we can make the right case. Question number eight, Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government on what date it will publish its proposals for setting the level of income tax. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government will publish its draft budget for 2018-19 on the 14th of December 2017. This will, of course, include proposals for setting the rates and bans for Scottish income tax. Murder Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? The Scottish Government has written to all the opposition parties asking us to set out our plans for income tax in advance of the budget. Now, we are quite clear in this party, we do not want to see Scottish taxes set at a higher rate 
than elsewhere in the United Kingdom. But given that we are showing uh, the Cabinet Secretary what our plans are, why do we have to wait to hear what his are? Cabinet Secretary. Well, M Murdo Fraser is right in the regard that neither the Conservative Party or the Labour Party has responded to the challenge ah. on contributing to ah. the debate on income tax. But you see, the only principle the Tories have is to simultaneously ta cut taxes and spend more at the same time. That's the budget contribution from the Tories. Uh, the Scottish Government has outlined our position and principles around taxation that include certainty, collecting tax in a progressive fashion, supporting public services and not passing austerity on to those uh, with the lowest incomes. Last year in the budget, the opposition parties asked me to listen to them. I'm listening, but you have to give a clear position where the sums actually <laughs> add up. And the budget negotiations will be crucial in setting out our plans for Scotland in which we'll engage with the other parties. Now, I will put forward a discussion paper and I hope that the other parties engage in a mature and rational fashion to inform that debate. And in that sense, the Scottish Government will show leadership but engage with other parties eh, as we should.